بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو نیوز روم آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ خالد بٹ ڈے از فرائیڈے دا 17th اف مئی 2024 اینڈ دیز ار دا اسٹوریز دیٹ وی ول بی ہائی لائٹنگ ڈورنگ دا کورس اف دا شو ویل بیگن لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹلمن ود چائنا بیکنگ دا پاکستانز گورنمنٹ اینڈ اٹس انیشیٹو فار اکنامک اسٹیبلٹی ناؤ دس ہیز بین انویلڈ ایٹ ویریس فورا اف لیٹ وی نو دیٹ آر ڈپٹی پرائم منسٹر and our foreign minister Ishaq Dar Sahib uh, was in China as well where he attended the fifth strategic meet between Pakistan and China uh, there was a very important joint communique that was uh, taken out at the end of it that uh, highlighted the different aspects of the cooperation between both the countries and the, the realization by both countries that they need to invest more in this robust uh, cooperation and how they will go about in the coming uh, days and months uh, a lot of uh, avenues were uh, streamlined as to uh, where pakistan and china will be concentrating on in the coming days they said there has been a lot of development as well during the meetings of mr sahagdar with the minister of finance uh, of china as well as with the head of the exim bank uh, then there are companies that are evincing interest uh, in investing in pakistan in the mineral sector and they have met with our prime minister uh, shahbaz sharif and our Sheh- uh, prime minister is also uh, going to leave uh, for china on an important trip in the next coming days so of course that they all uh, kind of uh, uh, joins up to become a very important segment as to Pakistan's economic stability and Pakistan's economic future and this is what we are going to highlight in our first segment. Our second story ladies and gentlemen is day 224 of uh, the Israel-Palestinian uh, war, genocide and uh, 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 crimes against humanity that have been going on and the f- very interesting fact is that in the International Court of Justice whereas uh, South Africa has again petitioned uh, uh, Israel uh, to uh, highlight to the world the atrocities that it has been committing and uh, Israel refuses to accept the fact that it is committing uh, genocide. This is also something uh, that uh, Washington has also said that what is happening in Israel uh, in Palestine is not uh, amounting to genocide. Uh, a lot of important question marks emanate and of course uh, the I- one of the ICJ judges has also asked Israel to come up with the tangible proofs of the fact that it is not committing what South Africa points to as genocide. Also thousands of Palestinian civilians in northern Gaza are cut off from water and food after a wing log Israeli incursion that has uh, le- led to different uh, uh, increase in number of casualties uh, on the sides. Israel uh, plans to deploy more troops and intensify its ground invasion of Rafa, something that the whole world has been warning uh, Israel against. Uh, there are a number of very important countries that have signed a letter, co-signed a letter, uh, uh, asking Israel not to move ahead with its ground invasion of Rafa. Will that happen eventually to the extent that uh, uh, the United Nations has been talking about or not? That only time will tell. This and more will be discussed in our second story ladies and gentlemen then our third story uh, pertains uh, to what has been going on as far as the heat wave in pakistan is concerned a new heat wave is about to hit different areas of pakistan that includes uh, punjab the daytime temperatures are likely to remain 4 to 6 degrees centigrade above normal in both sindh and punjab from the 21st to the 23rd of may and 6 to 8 degrees celsius from the 23rd to the 27th of may and uh, there might also be uh, severe heat conditions from the 23rd to the 27th of uh, may in different areas of pakistan including in punjab so we need uh, the people to take extreme caution when they go out under the sun finally today is also the world hypertension is kind of related to this heat wave because you know heat waves also result in different kinds of diseases including those who are p- prone to hypertension to become more hypertensive what is hypertension it is the increase in blood pressure today is a world hypertension day the theme of this uh, uh, day to this year is measure your blood pressure accurately control it live longer a lot of people do not uh, measure their blood pressure even Uh, despite the fact that they know that they are hypertensive or they have increased blood pressure and they need to do that on uh, on a very uh, of course and we need to make and do the necessary measures in order to control our blood pressures because if we can control our uh, uh, bp it will also lead to a better life a better heart and a better body let's begin with our first segment that concerns uh, pakistan china relations in the wake of these re- recent visit of Ishaq Dar Sahib to China to attend the fifth strategic meet between Pakistan and China and also the uh, 
upcoming visit of uh, Shehbaz Sharif to uh, China as well as the different initiatives that have been happening as a result of the uh, meeting of uh, both the foreign ministers in China and also the different Chinese companies that have evinced interest in Pakistan. We've been joined by two, uh, three guests in fact. Uh, let them introduce, uh, let me introduce in fact, <laughs> them to you one by one. Dr. Vakar Ahmed, Joint Executive Director, SDPI. Dr. Talat Shabi, Director, China Park Study Center, ISSI and Irtaza Shafar, Dr. Uskor at CPPG. All three of them are joining us for this very important uh, segment. Uh, we will begin uh, with uh, Dr. Vakar. Dr. Vakar, thank you very much uh, to have joined us. China seems to have thrown its weight uh, behind the Shahbaz Sharif government. A, it uh, uh, congratulates Pakistan on holding general elections, expressing good wishes for the new administration to promote economic development and prosperity. And they say, and I quote, China congratulates Pakistan on holding successful general elections and expresses good wishes to the new Pakistani government in leading the Pakistani people in their endeavor to maintain stability, security, and promote economic development and prosperity. How important is this statement in your point of view and how does this show China's confidence in this new government in Pakistan in order to move forward in different avenues, including economy. Thank you, Umar Saab. I think this statement comes uh, really at the backdrop of several parlays and uh, layers of engagements which have taken place. While, of course, uh, for general public, um, it may be a statement that is being made because uh, the, fo the foreign minister was there. But um, before this visit, there's been extensive work uh, since the new government came to office. There have been layers of engagement with the Chinese government. We do understand that naturally Foreign Office was engaging with their counterparts, but also the Planning Commission, the Finance Ministry, uh, the Central Bank, uh, the Ministry of Energy. Uh, they've all held very extensive uh, uh, dialogues. And uh, I believe that this statement, this very positive statement which has come out is a result of that assurance that uh, China now has uh, with and from uh, the current government. All right. Uh, uh, Vakar, uh, a Chinese company has today, I mean, a Chinese company by the name of MCC Tongson Resources expresses deep interest in increasing its investment in mineral and mining sector. We've also had an American company uh, some time back that has evinced interest in, the, uh, uh, of course, the mineral and the mining sector as well. Uh, the company did give a detailed briefing to the Prime Minister here in Islamabad regarding the construction of a mineral park in Pakistan. Uh, the Prime Minister has said that the government is taking steps on a priority basis to increase foreign investment in the country and also said China is Pakistan's long-standing friend and important partner in development. How do you see the strengthening of economic relations between both countries? You have seen, I mean, I, I, before I come to Ishaq Dar Saab and of course the forthcoming visit of our Prime Minister to China, I wanted to, uh, you know, have your point of view on these different Chinese companies that are sprouting up and showing uh, interest to invest in Pakistan? Yes. So I think there are two, uh, two challenges which Pakistan continues to face when it comes to the development of the mineral sector. One is that we can do it on our own. This sector is so advanced that uh, even after so many years of trying, we haven't uh, been able to muster indigenous capabilities, capacities to really uh, make a competitive mineral sector domestically, which has this uh, capacity to not only uh, provide locally, but also to export the mineral reserves. Uh, that is one. Second is that we haven't been able to create a cluster or an ecosystem within which the mineral sector could develop. And this is where I think the foreign expertise comes in. Pakistan has been trying very hard to approach potential companies who could come in and develop the kind of clusters which I've just talked about. Two of those governments, two of those provinces uh, that are economically less developed get to gain from it. So I'm specifically referring to the government of Balochistan and the government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Both, if you look at their industrial policies, both cite mineral, uh, mineral sector high up on their priority unfortunately, don't have the resources to develop this sector, look towards the federal government. Federal government itself is very scarce on resources. And I think in this context, the visit of this Chinese firm, as well as this, their presentation to the prime minister, 
really signifies their interest, that the fact that they are not just talking about uh, investment by a single entity, they're actually talking about doing all the civil work which is required to uh, bring in place a mineral park wherein uh, companies who can develop the mineral sector can be housed in big numbers. This is the kind of scale-up effect and sustainability that we require now. We have to go now to Irtiza Shafar. He's a do the doctoral scholar at the CPPG. Thank you very much, Irtiza, to have joined us. Our Prime Minister is going to visit uh, China uh, very soon in the coming days. China, as we very well know, has remained a steadfast partner for Pakistan. So many anecdotes as far as Pakistan-China friendship is concerned. Has always offered assistance to Pakistan amid uh, all the different challenges that Pakistan has been confronted with. How important do you feel is the visit of our Premier uh, to uh, China in the wake of A, this recent visit of Ishaq Dar Sahib to China, the joint communique that has come out that is extremely important uh, as far as the cooperation in different avenues is concerned. And, uh, of course, also strengthening other tangents of Pakistan-China friendship. Pleasure to be here on your show, sir. And uh, I think this timing is, is very important with the joint communique communi which has been released. Uh, uh, China and Pakistan are showing uh, a strengthening of relationships and an alignment of interests on so many levels which transcend just... Uh, 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 regional dynamics, even in the global sphere, they are. And uh, on, on the one hand, I think it is important to uh, reiterate the reality that China generally does not interfere in the domestic political regime type or the nature of the regime which exists in uh, her uh, neighboring countries or the world because it does not try to export the revolution or the communist system that they have in place. But so, so in, in, in that sense, this is some sort of an anomaly that they are, you know, suggesting uh, and siding with the legitimacy of the elections and, and, and uh, the stability of the government on the one hand. Uh, and I, I guess there is a larger uh, interest uh, in it because uh, China does not want to destabilize Pakistan. Now, in, in the context of Palestine and maybe a possible realignment of the international power configurations, which is happening because of a loss of legitimacy of the Western world in one sense, I think it is very important. And with the, the, the language of, of, of the communique, which has been released uh, four days ago, also suggests uh, that China is aligning with Pakistan. Now, in that broad sense, I guess it would be important to reiterate and everybody knows Pakistan's importance for China and China's importance for Pakistan. But Pakistan needs to uh, uh, be uh, uh, open to all sorts of international engagement on the one hand and not uh, have all, all its uh, you know, balls in one court in, in, in one sense. And strategic mutual assistance from China will help Pakistan. Uh, but, but the broader geopolitical uh, setting uh, does require on one hand that Pakistan tries to build up on its on her own uh, domestic manufacturing and indigenous industries uh, to, to have a more sustainable future. And the hope is that China will assist Pakistan uh, in the near future and in the long term. Uh, Irtaza, uh, I wanted to just correct you on one thing. The joint communicate was taken out the day before yesterday, not four days right. back after the meeting. So it's just uh, uh, barely 48 hours be, be, since the communicate came out. All right. The Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Sagda Sahab says on Thursday that the government under its economic reforms agenda offers attractive incentives for investment and has asked the Chinese entrepreneurs to take advantage of the friendly policies and set up labor-intensive industries in Pakistan. The labor cost, he says, is very competitive and much less as compared to the current labor cost in China. He mentions agriculture, textile, mining, and information technology as the prime areas where there is a great scope to do business in Pakistan. How do you see these incentives? What more needs to be done to make these sectors more investor-friendly in Pakistan? Yes, sir. Uh uh, it, it does. I mean, uh, there is that kind of dependency theory framework uh, which, which needs to be kept in mind. And I will talk in the abstract to a certain degree, but uh, it, it needs to be reiterated that our local domestic uh, manufacturing has decreased because of the way we've opened up and privatized in the last 30 years. And in, in, in that particular sense, there is that kind of narrative which is uh, peddled uh, that, that there is a neo-colonial design, uh, not just with China, but with 
uh, the Middle East as well, where uh, Pakistan's uh, indigenous uh, resources uh, are not being ut utilized properly on the properly on the one hand, and also uh, human capital. We, we we're lagging behind the Human Development Index in one sense. Now, whether that is a direct consequence of our negotiation with regional and international partners. Or is it is it because of our own uh, deficiencies remains a question in history and needs serious empirical investigation. Thank you so very much, uh, Itza Shafar, to have joined us and to have discussed your point of view as far as Park Channel relations are concerned and how to take those over. Thank you very much to have joined us. We've also been joined by Dr. Talat Shabi, he's the director of China Park Study Center at the ISSI. Uh, Talat Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. Now, Mr. Dar Ishaq Dar Saab says that the government has expedited construction of special economic zones and offers attractive incentives for the establishment of different industrial units. He talks about competitive and lucrative incentives, especially in special economic zones, in the export processing zones, in the Gawada free zone and in the special technology zones and work and talks about working on 13 key, key areas having great potential for Chinese and Pakistani entrepreneurs. How do you see this statement? How attractive do you feel uh, these avenues are for the Chinese entrepreneurs, the Chinese industry? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Uh, first of all, it's a great say, statement. It sounds very, it's a great uh, uh, that Pakistan now in, offers incentives on, um, on, on, on projects like a special economic zone. Now, uh, I think uh, uh, it is important that you need to create conducive environment for anyone uh, investing in our country. Second, you need to create some incentives for those investors who definitely choose between choose amongst many countries, choose Pakistan uh, for for the investment. Uh, we also should be mindful that it's not uh, fully the Chinese government; it is now the private sector also of China, uh, which has to be, which has to take interest in in the in Pakistani uh, enterprises and come come to Pakistan. So I think this is a very good good news for Pakistan that Pakistan has now realized that you need to create a conducive environment. And you need to incentivize uh, uh, investors who, who are trying to who are coming to Pakistan and investing in special economic zone. But I think uh, we need to do more because uh, this is uh, something that we we are hearing for a long time. And uh, I think this is now a time when uh, there's a new government in place, and Chinese have you know shown confidence in the new government. They have congratulated the new dispensation, and they are expecting a lot uh, from this government. Uh, with regards to CPAC. Um, uh, I think they, they are also, both countries, uh, as a matter of fact, are trying to push forward the projects uh, of CPAC, which were left over um, in, the, in the first phase. So uh, more important is, as you mentioned, that there are a few sectors they have uh, actually selected for investors. For example, mines and minerals are important sectors that they are now identified. And they, uh, as Dr. Bukhar was mentioning, you know, these are very difficult sectors to work with, to work in, basically. Because uh, domestically, he mentioned rightly that we have not been able to create or establish or, uh, you know, make infrastructure which could commensurate with the kind of work required in those mines and mineral sectors. It's a good news that uh, companies have now started approaching the government of Pakistan, our Prime Minister or our um, Planning Commission Minister, and they are coming to Pakistan with certain uh, clear-cut objectives. So it is a good news, but I think a lot uh, will have to be done in in the uh, near future when these companies uh, physically come here. They are physically, you know, involved in uh, various uh, sectors. For example, I have my, you know, reservations about uh, not, <clears throat> not establishing special economic zone so far because there's an infrastructure required for a special economic zone. So when there's a ready infrastructure, uh, like uh, plug and play infrastructure, uh, I think that kind of uh, plug and play kind of things are required by the people who are looking to invest in special economic zone, coming with industries, coming with their uh, expertise, and coming with their infrastructure here. <clears throat> so I think uh, this is good, good sign. This is a good uh, statement. But I think we need to be very, very, you know, uh, forthcoming on these on these areas. 
in order for uh, attaining some kind of, you know, we need to have some good results now. Now, let me refer to a statement made by the ambassador of China to Pakistan <coughs> yesterday, Ambassador Zhang Zaidong, who said that Pakistan's desire to enhance the ongoing commercial ties was welcome. He says because it is going to inject a new impetus in the Pakistan-China cooperation. But he also adds that China's high-quality development model offers new opportunities to Pakistan and that Beijing was ready to work with Islamabad to implement the important consensus reached by both countries' leaders. How lucrative, in your point of view, is this uh, high-quality development model that the ambassador refers to for Pakistan? And how do you see Beijing's readiness to work with Islamabad to implement this consensus <coughs> that has been reached by both leaders? Uh, this high-quality development uh, model that uh, China has now started advancing, the concept they have started advancing, is very important. You know, uh, but in, in this case, I think Pakistan has to uh, enhance its capacity to do, do quality, uh, you know, uh, become a part of that quality model that China is expecting. So I think first of all we need to enhance our capacity in, uh, you know, uh, for example, in, in industries, in trade, in connectivity, in all the fields. Probably we need to create a, create capacity to, uh, and definitely we would look to China for uh, uh, providing us the necessary skills to to be able to do that uh, quality development. Uh, this is a good idea, <clears throat> but I think uh, uh, we will have to work more ha harder on on uh, on this concept of creating uh, an atmosphere where uh, you know we can pace up with uh, with Chinese model. The problem is that China has a very fast paced model of development, whereas we have many problems. In, we have challenges uh, in the model that we pursue in development. So there's you know there's a there's a, a dichotomy. When we look at the models, you know, Chinese are fast-paced and we are not very fast-paced. So that is the kind of thing I think we need to create. We need to enhance our capacity to match up, to pace up with China uh, for doing various various projects. I think China should also, and Chinese are the way, you know, when I, whenever I interact with Chinese, they are also willing to help Pakistan in trying to, in, in creating that capacity that Pakistan needs to, in order for having quality development. Uh, Dr. Talat, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi tells his Pakistani counterpart that both sides will work together to deepen and substantiate China's eight major steps to support the high-quality Belt and Road cooperation and forge an upgraded version of the CPEC. And he, this, he says, they will do by jointly building a growth corridor, a livelihood-enhancing corridor, an innovation corridor, a green corridor, and an open corridor, and align them with Pakistan's development framework and priorities. How robust should this upgradation be? Uh, I think uh, this is also a great step uh, uh, taken by our Chinese uh, friends. They talk of corridor. I think they talk a lot about corridors. Uh, I wish these corridors' uh, dream come, becomes true. Uh, definitely, the areas they mentioned in uh, in the because these uh, the corridors that they are thinking in staging are in fact uh, will uh, will help us. Uh, you know, first, you know, our focus is uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, and definitely that that is going to help uh, Belt and Road Initiative of China. So this is also, uh, I think, in line with the, the development. Uh, that we look for in Pakistan, <clears throat> and I think they uh, the kind of help they want to uh, you know extend to Pakistan on development and revival of economy because it is also linked with the with the uh, with CPAC uh, and Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, with this government, I think Chinese have become more interested in uh, pushing these, these these projects. You know, see a very high level visits uh, have taken recently taken place. And uh, our Prime Minister is also going there. I think all these steps will have some practical manifestation uh, after our Prime Minister visits China. And when he comes back, I think we'll have some good news uh, uh, with regards to CPAC. And particularly, particularly when we talk of CPAC at the moment, we are looking for our industries to uh, revive and grow. We are looking for our exports to grow because that is what will uh, stabilize our economy. I think after this upgraded version is 
<clears throat> is supported by China. And we, of course, when, whenever I say it's supported by China, it does not mean that China will do it. it. It means that we also need to enhance our domestic capacity to do that. Because it's not only China that will do, that will help do it. We will also have to create capacity, enhance our capacity to do these projects with China. And I think we must learn, learn from Chinese expertise and Chinese skills. Um, otherwise, you know, the couple of corridors we know, you know, every now and then there's a corridor coming up. But we need to tell them that, look, we are very serious and we are very interested in uh, undertaking these uh, ventures that Chinese uh, see and uh, they foresee and they try, they try to bring in the Pakistani government. So, so we at the moment are very hopeful that after the visit of Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan and China, we'll have some good news with regards to industry, with regards to FDI, with regards to transfer of skill, particularly with regards to water. All right. Uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Talat Shabi, to have joined us at China Park uh, Study Center at the ISSI and to have discussed the different aspects of the China-Pakistan relationship that is uh, going to even become stronger in the wake of uh, this uh, strategic uh, dialogue that has been held be between the foreign ministers of both sides and, of course, the forthcoming visit of our Prime Minister uh, to the People's Republic of China. Let's begin with our second segment, and that concerns Day 224 of the Israel-Palestine war that continues without uh, any pause whatsoever. The Rafa is still under a lot of tension and of course Israel seems to be all geared up uh, to continue its ground invasion into Rafa. This said, the uh, uh, important uh, deliberations at the International Court of Justice are also going on. We'll be joined by Shahid Masroor Gul Kiani Saab. He's a former ambassador. Ambassador Shahid, thank you very much to have joined us and uh, joining us after a long hiatus. Let's begin without further ado. The Arab League calls for a United Nations peacekeeping force in the occupied Palestinian territory at a summit that is, of course, dominated by Israel's continuing deadly assault of the Gaza Strip. A Manama declaration is issued by the 22-member bloc. It calls for international protection and peacekeeping force of the United Nations. It calls for immediate end to fighting in the Gaza Strip. It uh, blames Israel for the war continuing. It uh, reiterates a long-standing call for a two-state solution along Israel's border before the 1967 war. How do you view the Manama declaration? First of all, thank you, Khalid, for having me on your show. Uh, you know, you're one of my favorites, so it's been a long time that we, were, we have not been together. Nevertheless, I'm honored. Uh, the Manama Declaration, uh, meaning I do not want to say that it's uh, uh, what is what it says. The thing is, the today at this time when we are talking about the most important thing, and I would say about the Manama Declaration is that they want UN peacekeeping troops in, in Gaza. I think that is one of the most significant things they can say. The first thing important is that the war has to come to an end. Without the war coming to an end, UN peacekeeping troops cannot go there. The, UN, the first thing, this will be discussed in detail by the United Nations Security Council. And you know what the United Security Council has at this time. United States is one of the most important and significant supporters of Israel. And I would say the the most challenging period in which this war is taking place is the U.S. elections. In U.S. elections, both Trump and Biden, both are, you know, at are loggerheads on many issues. But on one issue, they are quite close, which is support of Israel. None of these candidates can afford to say that they do not support Israel. Even though you have seen the Biden administration telling Israel to stop you know, this, the, the, the intrusion into Gaza. But short of that, if this issue comes into the Security Council or the General Assembly, either the United States abstains or it opposes the, the end to the war in Gaza. Without the end of the war in Gaza, how do you expect the food to reach the the, the the Palestinians in Gaza, they have been cornered in in that small you know what you call portion of Rafah. On the borders with Egypt, you have the Israeli troops trying to you know in my opinion it's very sad trying to kill as many you know Palestinians possible. At this time when I'm talking to you, over 35,000 
Palestinians have been killed. Over 18,000 children have been, uh, have been have died. Now, who's going to be answerable to, for, for this, this genocide? I'm surprised. The reason is that the, the Israelis, their forefathers, were a victim of genocide. We all know it. And that is the reason that the, the Jews from all parts of the world converge in what is now Israel. Yes, they, 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 they did commit genocide by, by pushing out the Palestinians who have been living there for, for hundreds of years. Now, genocide is being committed, as you see the International Court of Justice. The South Africans came out very bravely, courageously and said that they are committing genocide. Now, most embarrassing thing I think for Israelis should be that they should realize that they have been victims of genocide for which the whole world condemned the, the Nazis and others who have uh, won. Number two, in every European country where the Jews were living, they were, they were being persecuted by, by the Jews. By, by the by the other by, by the by the European countries, and now they are here. They had a golden opportunity to to deal with the Palestinians in a in a humane manner, but they failed. Let's hope that the resolution which the with the the Arab with the, the Arab countries which they have passed is is tabled on the in the United Nations. And the first thing, most important thing, Ms. Khalid would be. The war has to come to an end before any resolution of two state solution will come much later on, provided the Palestinians live. There is another problem, disunity amongst the Palestinians themselves, the PLO and the Hamas, they, they don't see eye to eye on each other. So it's very unfortunate. Speaking of PLO, one of the parts of uh, this Manama Declaration talks about uh, the Arab League saying that it considers the PLO the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people and it calls on all Palestinian factions to join under the umbrella of the PLO which is dominated by uh, uh, Fatah. So maybe that could happen, I don't know, but maybe this is a solution of all the Palestinian factions getting together. I doubt it very much they will ever come together. The, the ideology of the two are very, very different. You know, there are a lot of, lot of, you know, stories going around. The Israelis behind being the Hamas and all this thing, you know, we have read what happened. Now, the Hamas are radical Palestinians. The PLO is very close, you know, they are living within Israel. You, you, if you know Bethlehem and other places, they are within Israel. So, they can, the Palestinian, the PLO cannot afford to be at odds with, with the Israelis. It's unfortunate. That is the reason the Hamas don't see eye to eye with the Palestinians. So I doubt very much that in the short run, these or the Hamas will be on one page. Resolutions are passed. OIC Let, let, let's, Ambassador Shah, let's come towards uh, the I, International Court of Justice. Order. I'd like to understand your point of view as far as the ICJ is concerned. South Africa urges the ICJ to order a halt to Israel's assault on Rafah. It says the attacks on the southernmost Gaza city need to be stopped. And, of course, we all know that the ICJ is holding a public hearing over the extra emergency measures uh, sought yeah. by South Africa against Israel's attack on Rafah. Israel today on Friday defends the military necessity of its Gaza offensive and uh, it says uh, that uh, the Israeli Justice Ministry's uh, court regarding this is that uh, it calls South Africa's case which accuses Israel of violating the Genocide Convention completely divorced from facts and circumstances. Uh, the ICJ is told by the Israeli side that a tragic war is going on, but no genocide, quote unquote. This war, like all wars, is tragic for Israelis and Palestinians. It has exacted a terrible human price, but it is not genocide. What's your uh, comment on that? Uh, do you feel that uh, Israel can justify all the lies that it has said at the International Court of Justice? We also know that one of the judges at the International Court of Justice has also asked Israel to come up with tangible proofs that it is not doing what it says, uh, what the South African side is uh, labeling it as genocide within the different camps in Palestine. Meaning, if you eliminate 35,000 more than 35,000 civilians who have no arms, no weapons, nothing at all. Either you kill them or starve them. This is what they've been doing. Now, if you go back to the Jewish history, what were they being done? 
genocide. So they are saying this is not genocide. What is it then? Are these 35,000, were they given the opportunity to defend themselves? No. They were killed mercilessly and children, women, uh, uh, old people, they didn't know where to go. Bombing were being done from morning till evening. Even now, they'll be pushed to the wall. What is genocide? Elimination of people, you know, civilians, unarmed people being killed. Now, I have just heard that the United States, uh, assisted by the United Kingdom, have brought in some, you know, food and something. Look, it is, it is irony. You starve them, you kill them, and without any mercy, this is what genocide is, and the South Africa has a very strong case International Court of Justice saying that these people are being killed. And, you know, over 113 UN workers have been killed. So those who go to help them are also killed. Genocide, yes, it is taking place without, and today about 13 European uh, foreign ministers have, uh, have, have called upon Israel to, to stop this, uh, this war and allow the, the, uh, the food to, to reach the, the Palestinians. It's very unfortunate, I'm telling you. It's very, very unfortunate what is happening. There is, there, there is I just want to tell you, there is a reason. The South African uh, government and its people have suffered against in, 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 uh, for discrimination for, for years together. And this is the same, you know, the white racist government was very close to the, to the Israelis. And now when the, when, when the South Africans themselves, you see people of principle, now, when their chance came to stand up for those who are oppressed, they are there standing up for the Palestinians. It's a very courageous and very principled stand of the South Africans. All right. Ambassador Shahid, I'd like to also you know, uh, reiterate uh, the efforts that the South African side has been making uh, time and again. In fact, this is the third time that it has gone to the ICJ as far as highlighting the atrocities that Israel has been committing. And talking of atrocities, more than 15,000 children, Ambassador Saab, as you pointed out also, have been killed in Gaza. This has been confirmed by the Palestinian Red Crescent. You said 35,000, 35,303 have been butchered by Israel and the number is increasing with more or less every passing five or ten minutes and uh, 79,261 have been injured. And this is not going to, um, uh, this is not counting all the thousands that are still buried under the rubble of all the infrastructure that Israel has destroyed. And the time, by the time that they will be, be able to find those, the number would have surpassed 100,000. Amongst, uh, you know, uh, the dead are also a majority of women. Then there are the thousands of Palestinians that are incarcerated in jails without any allegation uh, whatsoever. Uh, the different uh, camps across Palestine and in Rafah are being bombarded as we speak right now. Will these atrocities ever end? What needs? To, what will be done in your point of view uh, as, as somebody who understands diplomacy much, much better than I do for this conflict to end? This conflict will only end when the countries who matter, and I'm telling, telling you very frankly, the United States, probably many people, I would say very straight, will be the only Israelis are now, if you see, are not even listening to the United States. And it understands because during the election campaign, I want to reiterate, this is a period in which, in which, you know, no presidential candidate can afford to offend the, the Jews inside the United States or all over the world. They need their votes. But Biden government has softened its attitude and has said to, to, towards the Palestinians, it said that allow the the assistance to go to the to the uh, Palestinians. Now, the in the United Nations, if, if this the United Nations Security Council unanimously, unanimously, as again want to say to you, especially the United States vote votes to end the war. This is one, you know, for the public. But behind the scenes, the United States has a very important role to play. If it sends a security, if, you know. The Mr. Biden picks up the telephone, tells Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, and also sends the Secretary of State on quietly to tell them to end this thing because it's been a long time. What Israelis have done, responded to what Hamas has done, is enough, is enough. Now, what the Israelis are saying is that the 
those those these, these, these Israelis who have been captured by the Hamas should be released. They won't do that. This is the only. It's it's, it's inhuman. But this is the only uh, what you call trump card the Hamas has to end this war. So it is the United States and the Western countries, especially those in the UN Security Council, who have who have the the vote to put an end to this war. Later on, this two two state solution and others would come much later on. It is first of all to save those who are still living and put an end to the prison in which they have been pushed near the, the Rafa near the border. The other thing is there are many Arab countries, I think, who have the clout. They should be able to use that clout to to you know censure uh, Israel. I just want to put on record. Pakistan's role during since this war began until today has been so forthright. Our our ambassador in United Nations, Munir Akram, if you see all the speeches which he has been making, the resolutions which have been passed by Pakistan has been very principled. We have stood by the Palestinians during this very very difficult period. All right, Ambassador Sahib, last question, but I want a very very short answer. 13 countries, foreign ministers from 13 countries have signed a letter warning Israel to halt its ground invasion of Rafah to allow more aid to reach the Palestinian population. It has been signed by Germany, France, United Kingdom, Italy, Japan, Canada, Australia, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, New Zealand, South Korea and Sweden. Will it have any impact? One phrase answer in your point of view. I doubt it very much only the visit of important Western European countries, foreign minister to Israel and talking to them straight, you know, across the table would would bring about the result. Otherwise, these resolutions have have never had any impact on the Israelis. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shahid Basrul Gulkiani Saab, to have joined us, to have talked to us about this uh, genocide that has been going on in Palestine since the last seven plus months. And although a lot of efforts are being made by at different quarters, whether it be by South Africa at the ICJ, whether it be by the Arab League, whether it be by even countries like Pakistan who are highlighting this issue, the important thing, as you have pointed out, Ambassador Saab, is that the important countries, the important allies of Israel do the needful in order to put an end to this uh, crime against humanity once and for all. Thank you very much, sir, to have joined us. Let's come to our last two stories very, very quickly. The first concerns the upcoming heat wave in Punjab. Now, daytime temperatures are likely to remain 4 to 6 degrees Celsius or centigrade above normal in Sindh and Punjab from the 21st to the 23rd of May and 6 degrees to 8 degrees centigrade from the 23rd to the 27th of May. This has officially been released as a statement. Heatwave conditions are predicted in Punjab during the upcoming week. While though dust storm, thunderstorm, rain is also expected in the upper parts uh, uh, during this weekend. Met Office has also informed that due to the presence of high pressure in the upper atmosphere, the heatwave conditions are likely to develop over most parts of the country, especially over Punjab. So we need to be extremely careful, extremely vigilant. You know what you need to do. You need to cover your heads. You need to have water along, uh, alongside or with you in small bottles and continue drinking water and prevent the exposure of young children, pregnant women and the elderly as much as you can from uh, direct sunlight because these days you need to be as careful as possible. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, today is the World Hypertension Day. What is hypertension? It is increase in blood pressure. The World Hypertension Day is being observed today. The theme this year is measure your blood pressure accurately, control it and live longer. If you can manage to control your blood pressure, you can live longer. There are so many diseases that you have and hypertension is not a disease that is extremely pertinent per se, but it's a disease that needs to be controlled properly so that it does not lead to other conditions like uh, cardiac arrest, like other issues, like, you know, everything is correlated uh, with the heart. So if you take care of your heart, whether it be in the form of regulating your blood pressure, you continue walking, you continue eating the right uh, uh, you know, vegetables and white meat and of course uh, continue to drink lots of water, you will be able to maintain your health and also have a good mental health. I think the mental and physical health are always correlated. So on this very day of hypertension, try to take care of yourself 
and of your loved ones. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's newsroom. We'll see you, inshallah, on Monday with stories and segments that pertain to you and Pakistan. This is the weekend. Have a wonderful one. But, of course, uh, do take care when it comes to this heat wave. Allah Hafiz.